Okay. All righty. So we have Dr. Browning here with us today. She's talking about cancer screening and cancer prevention. She is an oncologist here in Colorado at the Rocky Mountain Cancer Center in Thornton, Colorado. I met her about a year ago and she has just been wonderful and has tons of great information for us today. All right, thank you for the introduction. And the topic of my talk today is cancer screening and cancer prevention. Um, I don't know if I'm smart enough how to get the chat up at the same time um, as sharing my screen. So sorry if I don't see your stuff in there. Okay, so I'd like to start with talking about downstream and upstream in healthcare. And in terms of cancer care, I practice here, I practice downstream. And by the time a patient gets to see me, they usually either have a confirmed cancer diagnosis or they've got imaging findings that are suspicious for a cancer diagnosis or they're considered to be at increased risk for developing a cancer, um, either due to a family history or some sort of genetic predisposition. This is where I work. I apply the best available medical science to the patient in the room with me, um, while attempting to um, respect their humanity, understand them as a person, and come up and craft a plan of care that's aligned with and supportive of their goals and values in the context of application of best available medical science. And that is to either help in or, and for other folks, is to try to help folks live longer and feel better. That is where I live day to day. A bit upstream in terms of cancer care in the healthcare system is screening and early diagnosis. And primary care physicians live in that arena. So making sure that folks are recommended to get their age appropriate cancer screening, such as colonoscopy, mammogram, pap and pelvic examination, lung cancer screen. Um, and um, to try to diagnose cancers at an earlier stage. Stage is how we describe how far has a cancer spread. And that varies um, for various tumor types, and it usually depends on the size of the mass, the size of the tumor, whether or not there's any lymph node involvement, and whether the cancer has spread anywhere else in the body. And in general, when a cancer is diagnosed at an earlier stage, it is more highly curable. So we want to encourage people to get those evidence-based um, cancer screening, such as mammogram and colonoscopy, for early detection and better outcomes. But then let's go even further upstream into cancer prevention. What if we could prevent cancer from developing at all, altogether? And there are some things that can be done. It turns out that in the United States, about 20% of cancers could have been prevented through changes in lifestyle, such as quitting smoking. Another example of cancer prevention is HPV vaccination. Human papillomavirus is associated highly with cervical cancer, and also it's associated with about half of head and neck cancers. And HPV vaccination for preteens and teens is cancer prevention. There's some gnarly ethical, moral, behavioral associations with behaviors and a sexually transmitted infection. Um, but I would encourage you, those of you who have kids that are school age, to look into it, investigate it, and I would highly encourage you to get your kids vaccinated to HPV because that is highly efficacious cancer prevention. It's greater than 80% reduction um, in the risk of cervical cancer for girls that are fully vaccinated for HPV. So there's other lifestyle factors that can be involved in cancer prevention, such as quitting smoking. Let's explore more the prevention aspect and lifestyle. Much of the um, information I'm presenting to you, I pulled from the World Cancer Research Fund website. They have a really nice interactive website and their vision is we want to live in a world where no one develops a preventable cancer. So what is cancer? In general, I think of a cancer cell as a cell that's lost its normal regulation. We are multicellular organisms. We're made out of different tissues, eyeball cells, skin cells, colon cells, and those cells are growing and dividing in orderly fashion and replacing themselves as they need to. A cancer cell, the molecular hallmarks are described here, and that includes things like genomic instability, either inherited or developed, um, problems with DNA repair, resisting cell death or apoptosis, 
avoiding immune destruction. The immune system has a certain amount of cancer fighting ability. In addition to fighting things that shouldn't be in your body like bacteria and viruses, the body has a certain amount of ability to detect cancer cells as foreign and clear them out. And we know this based on the fact that folks who have had solid tumor transplants, such as a kidney transplant or an immunosuppression have higher rates of cancer development. Also folks with HIV and are immunosuppressed due to that have higher rates of cancer development. And in addition, this immune evasion has been harnessed recently through the development and approval of immunotherapies for various types of cancers. Um, and that involves blocking immune inhibition so taking the breaks off the immune system and allowing the immune system to go to town and find and fight cancer cells in various solid tumors, including lung cancer, melanoma, and also in refractory solid tumors with certain, um, certain DNA, um, uh, evidence of DNA instability characteristics. So um, also cancer cells have the ability to invade and metastasize to go places they shouldn't be able to do to induce angiogenesis, to recruit blood vessel development and growth to feed that cancer cell and abnormal proliferative singling. So the analogy that I use is a cancer cell. It's like a car and the gas is stuck on and the brakes don't work properly. And why the gas is stuck on and why the brakes don't work properly um, varies from individual to individual, uh, but it's de dysregulated cell division. And another um, representation of cancer development. So you start with a normal tissue, um, a cell goes bad, starts growing, dividing, forming a mass, and eventually takes on enough damage to the point to where it's able to grow and potentially spread, spread places in the body. So looking at the journey that a cancer cell takes from becoming a cancer cell from being a normal tissue to being a precancerous tissue that's a little dysregulated to actually taking on um, invasive capabilities. For example, in colon cancer, we think that it takes a precancerous polyp about seven years to turn the corner from a precancerous polyp to an actual invasive colon cancer. And there has been a well-described series of mutations that that tissue takes on before it gains that ability. And that's why for routine colon cancer screening, it's recommended that routine regular risk folks have a colonoscopy every 10 years because we think it takes like seven years to go from precancerous polyp. So we got some time to detect it. Different factors contribute to the cancer progression and that includes hereditary host factors such as inherited predisposition cancer, um, DNA instability, such as if somebody's inherited a BRCA1 or 2 gene mutation and has um, problems with double-stranded double DNA repair, or a P53 mutation, which is leaf raumani syndrome that's associated with increased risk of various types of cancers, so predisposed to those cells going bad. There's also other environmental factors, such as viruses like HPV in the setting of cervical and head and neck cancer that we've discussed, UV radiation in the setting of melanoma, various environmental carcinogens, such as Agent Orange, um, that's associated with various types of cancers in Vietnam veterans that were, so, uh, that were exposed to those toxins. In addition, there are diet and lifestyle factors such as energy balance, food intake, physical activity, alcohol intake, tobacco use, and other lifestyle factors. And those are more within our individual control. So let's explore those a little more. This is from the World Cancer Research Fund and what they have done is they've done meta-analyses of various studies, looking into various associations of lifestyle factors in cancer development. And what this particular slide is showing is colon cancer and physical activity. So looking at this forest plot, this is looking at high, just low physical activity. And what it shows is that high physical activity is associated with a lower incidence of developing colon cancer. So then they did meta-analyses of all sorts of various lifestyle factors and dietary factors. And the summary here for colon cancer um, risk and protective factors. So protective factors reducing or associated with a lower risk of developing colon cancer include physical activity, eating a diet that is rich in vegetables, whole grains, dairy, and calcium, and factors that are associated with increased incidence of colon cancer include 
eating processed meat, such as hot dogs, um, alcoholic beverages, um, obesity, or an unhealthy body weight, height, can't do much about height, and red meat consumption. Let's look at another cancer type. So this is esophageal cancer and there's different histology. So adenocarcinoma is derived from the gland forming cells that are usually found um, in the stomach and the, and the lower most part of the esophagus, whereas squamous cells are more found in the mid to upper esophagus. And this is looking at dose response of body mass index and esophageal adenocarcinoma specifically with the orange arrow on top. And higher body mass index is associated with a higher incidence of developing esophageal adenocarcinoma. Interestingly, it's the reverse correlation with squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus. So looking at the summary for esophageal adenocarcinoma risks, so increased body mass index, increased unhealthy body weight is associated with increased risk of esophageal adenocarcinoma and a diet rich in vegetables and increased physical activity is associated with decreased risk of esophageal adenocarcinoma. And then they found um, limited evidence to support the, um, the effects of various dietary and other interventions. Let's look at squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus, so that other histology. And this specific slide is looking at alcohol and its association with squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus. So as you can see, with increased alcohol consumption, there is a higher reported um, rate of esophageal squamous cell carcinoma. And it turns out there's no safe level of alcohol consumption. So in general for healthy lifestyles, we recommend that men limit themselves to two or fewer alcoholic beverages per day and women one or fewer, but less is actually better. There's no specific safe level. Here is the summary for squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus. And what it shows is that factors associated with increased risk of squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus include alcohol consumption and mate, which is apparently a drink that's um, uh, consumed in South America, scalding hot through a metal straw. And factors that are associated with decreased risk of squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus include physical activity and a diet rich in fruit and vegetables. So how has the World Cancer Research Fund presented these data in an interpretable manner? Um, so here's their key, green is good, red is bad, green is associated with lower risk of cancer, and red is associated with higher risk of cancer. And what they have done is presented a heat map. And yes, I know that it's very small and you can't see the labels, but on the left are various cancer types and on the, on the top are various lifestyle interventions. And you can see trends like this red column here, the green over here, the green over here, the red over here. Let's zoom in a little bit. So zooming into this red column, this is alcoholic beverages. So you can see that this represents that alcoholic intake is associated with increased risk of various types of cancers. Zooming in here, this one is physical activity. And you can see that physical activity is associated with decreased risk of various types of cancers. This red column is adult body fatness or obesity. So carrying an unhealthy weight is associated with increased risk of various types of cancers. Now, interestingly, while obesity is associated with increased risk of postmenopausal breast cancer development, um, obesity actually has the opposite association in premenopausal breast cancer. Obesity apparently is protective, um, but overall obesity is associated with 13 different type, types of cancer. So what they have done is to put together a set of, a package of healthy lifestyle recommendations that are associated with um, lowering a person's risk of developing cancer. And that includes maintaining a healthy body weight, being physically active, eating a diet rich in whole grains, vegetables, limiting fast foods, limiting red meats and processed meats, avoiding empty calories through sugar drinks, limiting alcohol consumption. Um, evidence doesn't support using nutritional supplements to reduce your risk of cancer. 
breastfeeding is associated with increased risk or lowering the risk of breast cancer. And after a cancer diagnosis, following these recommendations as you are able to. So I figured I took a look at your webpage and I figured that your company has a high level of expertise in product development and in project management and quality improvement. So I did a little fishbone for you. And so thinking about physical activity, I purchased a Peloton in March and it's been life-changing for me. It's amazing. It's just what I needed. I like you can do it on demand. They can choose the length of the workout, the, the music you want to listen to, the instructor you want. There's that social media aspect. Like it's perfect for me. I love it. Well, why might somebody not be able to get on their Peloton? And one thing that I'd like to do is, is if you would be willing to participate by annotating this, if you go to the annotate bot button on the top of your screen, and if you choose a stamp, and if you can um, choose a stamp symbol and go ahead and stamp on there what you think are major drivers for you, for your family, for your community, in terms of why might you not be able to do regular physical activity? I'll give you a minute to put your feedback on there. I'm not finding the ability to annotate in this. May oh, never mind. Yeah, on the top on the annotate. Yeah, there we go. So not enough time. So busy professionals. And why might you not have enough time? Maybe do you have kids? Maybe you don't have affordable childcare. Maybe why don't we have affordable childcare? Maybe we as a society haven't prioritized supporting young families with affordable childcare. Lack of regular routine. Yes, lack of extra space. Maybe you don't have a room to put the Peloton in. Maybe you can't afford a Peloton. Why can't you afford a Peloton? Well, there's high cost of living. Why is the cost of living so high? Why is housing so expensive? Why is healthcare so expensive? Healthcare and health insurance premiums, they're a burden for everybody. And health insurance is cost sharing over a population plus a profit margin for the insurers. We're all paying for each other's healthcare. And we have all these amazing medical innovations but we're all paying for each other's healthcare. We need to improve the value in healthcare with value being quality divided by cost. Yet we're a disease care system. We treat diseases, we patch holes in the boat, right? But as far as getting upstream, we're so still really early in that. In terms of systems-based practice, um, there are certain health systems that I've seen that have truly, um, adopted quality improvement to deliver high reliability healthcare delivery. And that includes Intermountain Healthcare, Virginia Mason Hospital in Seattle and Stanford University. And I'm currently taking a course through Intermountain in process improvement and leadership. And as a 12 week course, and I'm learning some basic process improvement tools that I can take back to my practice to deliver high, high reliability care. But yet, you know, there's so much room for improvement, there's so much opportunity. I've heard about how Intermountain does, they have an Intermountain um, um, operating model where they do tiered escalation huddles. So one is they've got annual um, vision and um, annual priorities and goals. And then they develop um, key performance indicators that support those goals. And those are communicated to the entire organization, including frontline healthcare professionals. And they're given line of sight and dashboards where they can keep track of these. And then they use um, process improvement science and implementation science to um, drive implementation of best practices throughout their organization. But that is an outlier. That is not how most medicine is performed. So we can use the tools from engineering um, to better deliver healthcare. So thank you all for your input. Not enough time for most folks and it's true. We all have 24 hours in a day and we choose how we spend that time. And spending that time on physical activity is an investment in yourself and in your health. Also for your organization, 
investing in people's health is an investment in your company so they can be healthy and productive and lower total cost of healthcare. Let's see what else folks chose. Yes, yes. All right, yes, and lack of expertise in healthy lifestyle coaching. So for example, um, I sought out additional training during my training in motivational interviewing. And motivational interviewing is um, a technique that is used to help people with health, healthy lifestyle changes, such as quitting smoking. But that wasn't built into my training. I had to say, hey, this is an area I wanna learn about. I had to go out and find that training. And I found it through the VA where the nurses actually do that. So, so I learned some um, skills from them. Okay, let me see if I can clear all the annotations. Thank you, everybody. Okay. So promoting healthy lifestyles, it seems like just do it, but there's lots of things contributing. So for example, urban design, having walkable and safe neighborhoods. And there are lots of factors that contribute to that. So for example, if you think about the legacy of redlining, the practice of redlining in the 1930s, those neighborhoods that were impacted by redlining, they still feel echoes of those discriminatory processes. Those neighborhoods, if you look at Denver, um, they still have inferior outcomes in terms of health, in terms of insurance coverage. There was an article in the Colorado Sun looking at COVID and a map, and it looked at both COVID diagnosis, hospitalization, and vaccination against COVID. And as you might expect, those neighborhoods that were impacted, that were redlined in the past, had higher rates of COVID infection, higher rates of COVID hospitalization, and lower rates of COVID vaccination compared to the other neighborhoods. So there's still legacies of these systemic injustices that we need to work on, um, on, on sharing and um, fixing. All right, so we're gonna go back downstream a little bit again. So going to midstream, to screening and early diagnosis. So for those of you who've chosen to call in today, please prioritize your health maintenance. Please make sure that you talk to your primary care physician about getting all of your age-appropriate cancer screening. That is part of what your primary care physician should be doing for you, but there can be a variety of reasons why it may or may not happen. I worked as a primary care physician for a year out of training, and it was difficult to be responsible for your whole patient's care, all of their 30 medical problems, and their paperwork, and don't turn off my power paperwork, and to make sure you get all the health maintenance done. And when I worked as a primary care physician, I was working at the VA, serving our nation's veterans, and they have a nice built-in tickler system that shows you when the patient is due for a particular health maintenance examination. But not, ele not all electronic medical records have this capability. And plus you can have dirty data. Maybe you're not entering the data in the right spot, so it's not up to date and it's not super useful. All right, so age appropriate cancer screenings, colonoscopy, um, you should start for routine risk. Just anybody off the street, start at age 45 to 50. And if there's no polyps, you go every 10 years. If there are polyps, you go usually every five years. If you have increased risk, either due to hereditary predisposition, such as Lynch syndrome or a family history of colon cancer, if there's been a first degree relative who has had a cancer diagnosis, you wanna recommend starting colonoscopy screening at 10 years prior to the diagnosed age. So let's say somebody was diagnosed, let's say, let's say my mom was diagnosed at age 45, then you would want me to start at age 35, as well as her siblings to start at age 35, start 10 years earlier than the earliest diagnosed first degree relative. When to stop colonoscopy screening. So it, that is a discussion to have with your primary care doc. Um, generally, if we estimate that somebody might have 10 years or more to live, it's still reasonable to continue with, um, with cancer screenings, such as colonoscopy screenings. There are other alternatives. If you really don't wanna have the gold standard, which is the colonoscopy, then you could go ahead and proceed with something like the Cologuard, which involves detecting um, tumor mutations, DNA and DNA and detecting occult blood. But the gold standard is the colonoscopy and it's both diagnostic and therapeutic where in the colonoscopy, um, they can both find polyps, pre precancerous polyps, and if they find one, take it out, prevent it from ever turning the corner. Lung cancer screening. So there is screening for lung cancer for folks that are at increased risk for lung cancer. And that includes current or former smokers with a 
20 pack year history of smoking and are either still smoking or have quit within the last 15 years. Of course, the best lung cancer prevention is to quit smoking. So work on that if you're a smoker. Um, but otherwise, you can do low-dose CT screening on an annual basis. That can pick up nodules. That can pick up a lung cancer at an earlier stage and um, has been associated with improved outcomes. Breast cancer screening. So start at age 40 to 50. As a medical oncologist, I would prefer you start at age 40. We recommend breast self-awareness to know your breast tissue. If there's any lumps or bumps or anything that's not normal, bring it to medical attention regardless of your age um, and start annual mam mammogram screening. Some women due to family history um, or genetic predisposition are considered to be high risk of breast cancer. So if we have a model that estimates a woman's risk of breast cancer is greater than 20% over her lifetime, she's considered to be at high risk of breast cancer. And we can do additional, more intensive screenings, including annual breast MRI, in addition to mammogram. So if you have a family history of more than a couple people with breast cancer in your family, I would recommend talk to your primary care doc, potentially see a medical oncologist like me, and then we can run your family history and demographic data through a model called the IBIS model to estimate what is your lifetime risk of breast cancer and whether you would qualify for those high risk screenings. And that can help with early detection. Cervical cancer screenings, um, get your pap and pelvic examinations between age 25 and 65. Prostate cancer had some changes to the screening recommendations in 2012. So now it is, instead of every man, it's just a risk benefit discussion. Um, and the concern was for there were previously, um, we were overdiagnosing older folks with pretty indolent low-grade prostate cancers and they were experiencing side effects of the treatment. Um, so have a risk benefit discussion. I would prefer you go ahead and do it, but have a risk benefit discussion with your primary care physician. Genetic risk assessment. So if you have a family history of more than a couple of folks in your family who have had cancer, whether it is breast cancer, colon cancer, leukemia, sarcomas, brain tumors, um, you can meet with a genetic counselor and they can review your family history and let you know whether um, genetic testing would make sense to make that, that make that decision to see if there's any kind of hereditary cancer risk running in your family. And then it could be like the Angelina Jolie situation. If you found out BRCA mutation yet have never had cancer, you could choose to have prophylactic surgery. So join me on Peloton. That is my leaderboard name. I would love to see you. I added alchemy as a tag as well as RMCC. And I would be happy to take your questions. Um, honestly, this was so informative. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, this was amazing. I've learned so much. I don't know if anyone has any specific questions. Does anyone want to come off mute? I got a quick question. I didn't see uh, sun exposure on there for cancer and stuff like that. Absolutely. That is a risk factor. And also avoiding UV tanning beds. Um, I know that I went tanning when I was in college and it's horrible and it's bad for you and don't do it. What other questions or comments? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Browning. I have a question. My wife uh, has the BRCA1 gene. She went through, uh, you know, very serious breast cancer. So we tested the entire family, and uh, one of my sons has it. He carries the gene now. So what, what do we, what do I as a father do uh, for my son? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to exactly. kind of, you know, encourage him. Exactly. Exactly. How old is your son? He's 23. 23. Yeah. So BRCA mutations are associated with various types of cancer, including prostate cancer, melanoma, even uh, male breast cancer, um, ovarian cancer for women. Um, so he should, he should probably see a medical oncologist like me for continued follow-up. And what I would advise is um, to do the prostate cancer screening, to do the PSA screenings and once he is old enough, and also just to know his body. So to know how he feels at baseline and if he has any unusual symptoms that are not normal for him, whether it's a lump or a bump, a new persistent pain, unintentional weight loss, or just not feeling right, persistent symptoms that last more than a couple of weeks to seek medical attention and have it investigated. 
So that would be my recommendation. So I would encourage you folks um, I figured I'm talking to a bunch of engineers. I'm married to an engineer. I can work with engineers to think about how you can use your specific skill set in product development and quality improvement and volunteer your time and effort um, to helping um, the healthcare field. So specifically, there was a, um, a study that was presented at the American Society of Clinical Oncology this past summer about um, lung cancer and equity. And what they did at University of North Carolina, they did a study intervention looking about improving utilization of curative intent surgery in the setting of lung cancer, early diagnosis of lung cancer, and looking at equity problems. And they partnered with the community. They found out what was important to the community. The healthcare system partnered with the community. And they found that at baseline, Black Americans had only like it was a 60 or 65% I'm going through to curative intent surgery for early stage lung cancer, which is totally unacceptable. I mean, lung cancer is bad, but you're losing that chance of cure if you don't even go to surgery. And they were able to partner with UNC and the community, and they were able to get that up to greater than 95, I think it was 93% for both white and black populations with this pairing with the community. So your skill set is needed. I think that's all I got, folks. Oh, there's a bunch of stuff in the chat, but I can't see it. Everyone is just saying thank you so much for this. This was so informative. Um, I will add you as a Peloton writer. I did get a Peloton about a year ago as well. Televangelists. <laughs> I, I do have one more question if we have a, a minute for it. Are, are there any uh, populations in the world that we can learn from that have almost zero cancer rates? you know, isolated populations, whether in Asia, Africa, other, you know, remote places in the world where cancer just isn't a, uh, isn't a factor? That is a good question. And I don't have answers for you, but we're somewhat related is if you look at the New England, New England Journal of Medicine study on the HPV vaccination, it was out of one of those um, Norwegian countries like Sweden or Norway or mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. And um, they looked, they were looking at the effect of HPV vaccination and risk of cervical cancer. And it was huge. So those women who got the full HPV vaccination had like a, a greater than 80% lower risk of developing cervical cancer. It is cancer prevention. Yeah. I yeah. was just curious, lifestyle, you know, diet has a huge factor in everything from heart disease. Exactly. Uh, to cancers. And it's just interesting trying to get people you know, I was I'm thinking, okay, do I offer a stipend to the company to encourage people to get off their mm -hmm. bunts, you know, once a day and, and get out? Yeah. And do it, because or do so you get a, do you get a Peloton in the workplace area? We don't. So we work remotely. So here's the new kind of the new, how we're going to work as a company. We're disaggregated across. And I think, I think it's likely to remain that way. And so how do I encourage people to invest in themselves? You know, exactly. Uh, it's just a and, huge upfront investment, yeah. two thousand dollars yeah. upfront to get a Peloton. Maybe you consider subsidizing just that. Just to walk, or just get people to walk, or or a gym membership. I, you know, I'm a workout fanatic because I was in the, you know, I was in the military for twenty eight years as part of the lifestyle. But I could absolutely have a gym at home, but I would rather pay the ten to twenty five dollars a month because I'm so cheap. If I don't go to the gym, I feel bad. And I, I wonder if, you know, how we encourage behaviors where people are investing in themselves as well. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, Education is a start. Yeah. Education is a start and awareness is a start. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right. That. Well, thank really you for the opportunity talk. to give my TED talk. Thank Appreciate you your time. So thank you so much.